I've been investigating the Bigfoot topic for about eight years now. The subject of Bigfoot has taken me to some of the most amazing places nature has to offer. And it's also led me to have experiences that I never thought I'd actually ever have. Since the beginning, there's been multiple occasions where I'd stumbled upon something that I couldn't actually explain. I say the word stumbled because I still feel like so much of this is up to luck or chance. This latest expedition that you're about to take along on was an amazing journey into the heart of the Rocky Mountains, to a location where I do suspect something unusual has been and is still going on. More often than not, something weird seems to weasel its way into the majority of my adventures at this location. The destination of this trip is a small remote lake about 17 kilometers into the mountains. 17 kilometers on foot with a heavy pack. Despite the distance and the struggle to get there, I do feel the area is extremely promising in the sense that it might turn in some great evidence of the existence of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. When you're going on these Bigfoot trips, the thing is, is that you're not just packing for like a hiking trip. I mean, you are hiking and doing like you know, the backpacking thing, but you're also packing for filmmaking and you're packing for Bigfoot investigating or Bigfoot research or whatever you want to call it. So you're not just bringing your hiking equipment, you're bringing all this camera gear, you know, all your lights, your lenses, your tripod, uh, and you're also bringing your Bigfooting stuff. So your night vision, you know, measuring tapes and all that kind of stuff, you know, equipment for recovering like hair samples and you know, if you do come across something where you can recover DNA. So, you know, you're carrying gear for three different things, not just hiking. And people always say all the time, like, dude, your pack looks ridiculous. It's, it's massive. Why do you carry so much stuff? Well, that's the answer for that. It's because I'm not just hiking. If I was just hiking, I wouldn't have to carry all this other crap. It's a little bit more complicated, you know. You're packing stuff that you probably won't even end up using, you know but you would like to have anyway. It's just in case you do find something. So, you know, that's the reason for, you know, the pack being so large and heavy. And, uh, you know, it makes the whole trip that much more difficult because you got to carry it all, so. Most of the time when I go out to these areas, I travel alone. And not just because I enjoy solitude for the most part, but also because not many friends of mine enjoy the activity of hiking long distances over a mountainous terrain with a 60 to 70 pound backpack. I was lucky, however, to have my friend and fellow Bigfoot researcher Keenan on board for this trip. Keenan is extremely knowledgeable in the topic of Bigfoot and is familiar with the vast majority of reports and sightings in this area. As usual, when we get together, it doesn't take long to begin theorizing about the creature. So one of the things that Ken had commented on too, right, was this idea that they make mistakes when they're uh, around their children or when their children mess up, right? Their children are seen by humans. But for me, the one thing that I've been convinced of from anecdotal evidence over the last couple of years was more along the lines of they seem to have this um, proclivity to have, they get distracted when they're doing something particularly engaging. So you think of a person who gets really into puzzles or who's really into a video game. They become blind to everything that's happening around them. They get tunnel vision on that thing. There are all of these stories of Sasquatch cracking open clams or oysters, um, or they're fiddling around with rocks or they're banging a stick against a tree to like a rhythmic pattern and people walk up on it and even as they're approaching you know 15 meters 10 meters 5 meters making noise as they walk up to them they don't actually hear them because they're too busy they're too engaged and enthralled in what they're doing and actually that's something that Chris Noel goes into as well with uh, his Sasquatch Savant theory is this idea of almost an autistic like fascination and engagement at where they're all in they're completely enthralled in what they're doing the journey to this area is absolutely stunning. Glacier-fed creeks and spectacular views riddle the landscape. As far as the hike itself goes, it's a lot of up and down and up and down. Not too bad at the start, but around the halfway mark, it really does begin to wear down on you. 
It's also at this halfway mark that we came across a spot where I had some bizarre things occur about a year prior. On an earlier trip of mine back in the spring of 2020, I came across what appeared to be a large humanoid footprint that stepped heavily on the ground right on the trail. So I was just coming down the trail from that way, going this way, and uh, there's an impression here in the ground. Now, if you look at it, like it's pretty, it's pretty big. There is like a, a ridge kind of in the middle there that's higher up than the back and the front. You know, in the Bigfoot world we call that the mid-tarsal break. Ooh, the legendary mid-tarsal break. But is that what we're looking at? Odds are probably not, but whatever it is, it's big. But I have to say it's probably from a person because there are a lot of other people tracks on this trail. This is the only one I've seen like this that is this big and old with the, the pine needles in it kind of pressed down. And like this area not too long ago was covered in snow. This footprint was far from being confirmed evidence of Bigfoot, but it was unusual enough and compelling enough to really get me excited to see what I would come across from then on. It also was enough to creep me out to the point where any little noise that I heard could potentially be a Bigfoot creature. Strangely enough, what happened not long after finding the track was a startling sound. Get in there. <laughs> this is um, right about where I heard that rock clack. I was coming through here. And I heard it, it sounded like it was coming from that direction. And so I kind of like snuck through here, down to where this log is. Did you and was, well, no, I left it on. I was so caught up in what I was doing and then I kind of scurried down to the rocks. Couldn't see shit. And then I camped in here. Yeah. I was walking along the trail into a densely treed area along the riverbank when a very loud and distinct rock clack stopped me in my tracks. Of course, many people suspect rock clacking to be a sign of Bigfoot, a method of communication, or a way of letting you know that they're there. After finding the track and then hearing this sound, I was really on edge. Well, that was f***ing startling. I was just walking down the trail, not thinking about anything other than just walking and where my feet are going, basically. And then out of nowhere, a f***ing rock clack, just like, you know, your typical Sasquatch rock clack. As soon as I heard that, I turned the camera on and I tried to kind of sneak out to the edge of the, the creek here. But it came from somewhere over there. And it was just one clack and it didn't sound like rocks were falling. You know when like a rock falls and it tumbles down this sandy You can hear smaller pebbles and stuff coming down with it. And it was just a clack. And it was loud and it was something. Like, I suppose there's rocks everywhere, right? So a rock could have just, could have fallen somewhere, but. It... And the, the weird thing when you think about it is like, right when you're in a certain spot, that's when the rock falls or that's when the tree breaks. Coincidence, possibly, but I, I don't see anything and I haven't heard anything else. And the sun is going down and I really need to get moving. This is also a really nice camp area. So 
Like I could camp here and hope to hear something else. Or I could get to the lake where I really want to go. I don't know how much further it's going to be. It's almost 8 o'clock. Like I'm almost out of daylight. But man. My heart was racing and my hands were shaking. On that trip, I decided to spend the night in that exact area in hopes of catching a glimpse of one of these creatures. What I ended up catching a glimpse of was something totally different. Well, that was pretty creepy, not gonna lie. A dead silent um, light of some kind, just a white light. No blinking lights like you'd see on an airplane, like red lights or, or blinking white lights, just a solid white light. Flying from west to east and just, you know, very peacefully, I would say, but very low, not very high at all. It's about 4.20 in the morning, 4.20 a.m. It is the 6th of May. I don't know how it picked up on the camera. I had the ISO cranked up all the way and I was trying to focus using the autofocus at first and then I switched it to manual, but I, I, like, I can't tell on the little screen if it was in focus or not, but you can see the light. And then uh, you can kind of see it disappears behind the tree and then reappears and then disappears behind the other trees. But every time an airplane has flown over, there's been a couple of like airliners that have flown over and you can really hear them, like, they're pretty loud. Um, but this thing, dead silent, so I don't know what it was. Kind of creepy though. Like it's early in the morning, I'm sleeping in the open air. I didn't even set up a shelter, just my sleeping pad and my sleeping bag, so it looked like it was going to be a clear night. And, uh, I just woke up early and uh, made some hot chocolate and it was just kind of pacing around trying to kill time. And my light flew over, so hopefully I don't disappear. Get abducted by aliens when I'm out looking for Bigfoot. I always keep hoping that we'd see like a Sasquatch across something like that. So you had like a little opening where there's been a, like a mudslide or a landslide in the past. Well, when I camped here, that's what I kept looking up there because I heard the rock clack. And so oh, yeah, the was... whole evening I was watching this ridge. Yeah, it's creepy coming back here alone. Yeah. Like your mind starts playing tricks on you. And when I came out here on that trip, it was real early in the season. There's nobody else out here. So this area has its own history of strange occurrences. 
at least to me anyways. This is a relatively well-used trail, which makes me wonder, how many other backcountry travelers have had strange experiences out here? Has anyone ever had a face-to-face -face encounter with Sasquatch? Or at least heard any strange noises or something out of the ordinary? Anyways, we pushed on hard to try and get to the camp by a decent hour. The smoke in the air from all the nearby wildfires didn't make it any easier for us. But eventually we made it to where we wanted to go. I'm dying. I've always really loved this camp area due to its remoteness, but with that feeling of remoteness comes a sense of vulnerability. This small lake is surrounded by dark woods that really give off a creepy and unsettling vibe. We got our camp set up and wasted no time cracking open a victory drink and relaxing near the fire pit, though the local fire bans prohibited us from having an actual fire. This area has become our regular area to investigate for me for one main reason. A bizarre occurrence that happened back in 2015. I took this time to go over the experience with Keenan, but it's also worth noting that I had actually visited this spot about a month prior to this trip in hopes of having a run in with what I think was most likely a Bigfoot creature that I suspect visited this camp all those years ago back in 2015. The second hump, like the top hump there. Yeah. Uh, if you go up there and a little bit down, mm -hmm. that's where I had something like full on walk by <clears throat> the tent. Like, like two was, feet? Like dum, dum, dum. Yeah, like it sounded like two feet. That was what back time? in like 2015, mm -hmm. in like the middle of the night. So I'm here at a place that I call Hidden Lake, and uh, I don't know if it's actually called Hidden Lake, that's just what I have called it since I've known of its existence. And this is the spot where I had a really weird encounter back in 2015, and I've mentioned it in uh, other videos that I've made. But uh, back then, I was with two other people, and um, one of our tents was set up where my tent is right now there and the tent that I was in was actually set just up here 
Like I've been trying to find the exact location where I had the tent, but I can't really remember. I think it was, I think it was right here. I want to say right here. It's either here or just over there. But we were up here camping. It was the second night here. Uh, we had hiked in, like this place is pretty deep into the bush. It's like a, a day's hike. But we had hiked all the way here the first day and spent the night. And then the second day, uh, we hiked up to the mountain, uh, like right on, on the top of the ridge back there. I don't know if you can see it in the shot, but it's back there. So we hiked on top of that ridge. We hiked back down, kind of got lost on the way back actually. Uh, but eventually in the evening found our way back to the camp. And the second night is when the weird thing happened where in the middle of the night, I randomly woke up to something walking past the front of the tent, probably like 20, 30 feet maybe in front of the tent. And uh, this is exactly where it happened. So it actually, it walked by the tent and then it made a grunting sound. And like at, at that point in my life, I'm thinking it's a bear. So I was lying on my belly in my tent like with my knife in, in one hand ready to fight a bear <laughs> so I mean I definitely would have lost but it's all I had at the time for protection so eventually like it walked off and you know I fell back asleep so but this is where it happened and I suspect you know just over there is where the creature walked by from left to right maybe like I said 20 or 30 feet that way and uh, kind of just disappeared towards the mountain and that was that was it basically and uh, in the morning I woke up I didn't even remember that it had happened you know it wasn't until later in the day when we were on our way home that I was like oh yeah like I remember this weird thing happening last night and I like it just didn't feel like a dream it felt like a thing that actually happened and I still remember it like it actually happened so I mean I'm back here alone for the night and I'm hoping something crazy happens. I'm hoping to have something similar to that happen tonight. So I'm gonna try some wood knocking and try and lure something in here somehow. But pretty much where I'm standing right now is where I suspect that creature walked. If it was a Sasquatch, like it could have actually been a bear. I mean, this is bear country. And um, you know, lots of bears have been seen in this area over the years so in that sense it is kind of a dangerous spot and it is a very remote lake like this is really tucked away up in the mountains the cool thing is is that I'm actually right now using the exact same tent that I had on that trip which is cool so if it is a Sasquatch if it was a Sasquatch maybe it'll recognize the tent <laughs> I think that trip was probably like the first or second time I ever used that tent. And uh, I'm still using it today, so there it is right there. So I don't know, I keep uh, walking down to the water to kind of, you know, look along the shore on the other side of the lake because I want to, you know, see if there's anything across there watching me. I have this like image in my head. I have this, um, scenario in my head where I'm at the edge of the lake and that's when I see Bigfoot is across the water on the other side just kind of watching me and there are fish in this lake so you know it would be a good source of food for a Sasquatch and uh, you know I don't think it would be too crazy to think that they would come down to the water to to catch fish every time I hear a fish jump though it kind of startles me I think there's something splashing around in the water that's, you know, something that's not a fish, something like a, like a Sasquatch.
I have no real way of confirming what exactly walked by the camp back in 2015, but I've always suspected and wondered if it was a Sasquatch. My logical side says it was probably a bear, but my gut wants to say Sasquatch. After explaining this weird event to Keenan, we were just chatting and joking around in the camp, and then this happened. Feel free to go grab that second beer whenever you want to. Oh, dude. Like, I'd like to say that I would save one for tonight and one for tomorrow. That's worth it, man. I can't. I don't think I could do that. Yeah. Like, once you start going, there's no stopping, you know? Well, there is, because you only get two. No. I guess there's two down there, so you could knock me out and probably get the half of this one. Steal your nice backpack. <laughs> I have to wake. I'm wake not back. carrying your shit out of here. more of a wood snap. Camera's rolling. I should point it over there. Yeah. I would make a move. That mic is directional, so oh, it might it might not have picked that up. I would make a move. In case someone's moving through. We waited around near camp to see if any other tree knocks or snaps would occur. What we didn't want to do was scare off whatever it was that made that noise. One thing is for sure is that this incident definitely set the tone for the rest of the night, and the rest of the trip for that matter. As darkness fell, we prepared for our first night and got all of our gear situated in our tents. Well, I was the only one with a tent and Keenan had a bivy shelter, which is essentially a waterproof sleeping bag cover. The amount of exposure and vulnerability you feel in those bivy bags can make you incredibly uncomfortable while on a Bigfoot expedition. I took some time before getting into my tent to scan the lake shore with my night vision. There was nothing out of the ordinary that I could make out. We turned in for the night, but about an hour or so after falling asleep, I was awakened by Keenan, who seemed a bit shaken up by something. So again, it feels like when I heard it, it was down and then further in that direction. So you have a first one which is like a clunk clunk or like a clunk clunk with a snap of like a like a twig break, like a floor level and then holy shit. So I turned the audio off on my phone and then I just moved my face right up to the screen of the bivy shelter. And then, less than a minute later, there is a similar, but just as distinct, but quieter one, as if it was a little bit further to the left. These all still feel like they're within the range of, like, falling from the trees, I think. But it was the first one, followed by the second one, and... I guess that's what we're here for, right? <laughs> that is correct. pine cone falling, it was like... Really? <laughs> yeah. And, but the first one was like... But like, bigger, and in that direction. Sometimes when those pine cones do fall though... They are thuddy. They are pretty loud. Yeah. 
Whatever it was that Keenan heard was coming from the exact same direction as the wood snap we heard earlier. Was it the same creature? I have no way of knowing for sure, but it seemed like maybe it was more than just a coincidence. We went back to sleep, and surprisingly I passed out right away. Keenan, however, after suffering from the heebie-jeebies, took a bit longer to pass out. Nothing more happened that night. We woke up to a very smoky morning and began prepping for a full day of exploring the nearby mountainside. We wanted to get higher in elevation to an area that would be a great hiding spot and overlook position to observe any hikers who might visit the lake. The weird thing to think about is that somewhere out there, if they're around, if they're real, is that somewhere out there is the place where they live. Like a place where they sleep yeah. and have their kids yep. and just exist. And nobody's been able to ever find. So, unless you think of like the, the Mushalat Harry guy who was taken away to that place where there was apparently like over 20 of them. Yeah, no, that's true. But <clears throat> there's always the possibility that they're true nomads, right? That idea that they really don't belong anywhere and that they move around continuously that's why you don't find anything more substantial than like a little nest or uh, like a bedding area where something big has been right right there has to be somewhere safe to keep young ones yeah that's the thing that strikes me like a cave or something yeah a cave or <clears throat> cave or I think people have referred to them historically as nursing areas back to our campsite from the road. Now we're on the opposite side of an unnamed lake, climbing up a 45 degree hill over a deadfall. So one of the things that comes from several of the reports we've received and then some of the ones that we've seen through other groups are when we look at boulder fields like this, we've come across, or sorry, in the reports, we've come across strangely stacked rocks, but we're talking about boulders in excess of 150, 200 pounds, stacked on top of each other as if something is trying to access a crevice to access an animal den or uh, something similar, or digging through looking for something edible. And we've seen that west of Dutch Creek, uh, uh, west of the Livingston Public Land Use Zone here in Alberta, and there's reports of that in the US as well. But the distinct feature is that the rocks and the boulders that are being moved are outside of the range of human comfort. Uh, or human capability, and it's in an area not frequented by people. Ugh. Even you see like those smaller ones up here, they're not like stacked on top of each other, but we would go take a look to see if there's like a hole that it was pulled out of, right? Because I don't think anyone would be incentivized to come up here stand on all of this like precarious stuff and 
be manipulating these several hundred pound boulders. I guess the other thing we'd be looking for here too, I know uh, some of our counterparts in the US too, one of the things that they think they find are nut cracking stations, which would be like a stump with a bunch of cracked nuts and the sign of a crushing rock. We'd be looking for something like that here as well. So another sign of manipulation, right? So all of these rocks have like this green stuff on it. But when you're looking for like signs of manipulation, if you look on the, the bottom side, all of them are completely clean. So only the side exposed to the sun has this green stuff, has this discoloration, has like this sort of weird texturing, but the bottom side is completely smooth. They're all that way. They're all that way. So. Uh, when we're going through here looking for these signs of like, d disturbance or activity, looking for this, looking for this color. You find it under the big boulders too as well. It doesn't look like anything is going through here manipulating this looking for, looking for a meal. Ugh. So I guess we're moving on. <laughs> really all we're looking for is any kinds of signs of deliberate manipulation. What I'd love to find is what that Olympic project is found with the, uh, those nesting sites. Oh yeah. And they're like, but they're like woven. They're not just st stacked branches. Yeah. They're they're woven into each other, and they're carried. The material was carried to that location from another area. The interesting thing too about like all the all the Sasquatch stories is that. <clears throat> They don't seem to kill it and eat it on the spot like a wild animal. They kill it, take it to a safe space. Yeah. That's like a leopard or something. Up in Africa, the leopard will kill their animal and then... Cougars here in Canada will take their kills into a tree, which is why yeah. we find That's the same with carcasses in trees. If I was gonna have like a long distance sighting, I'd expect to see them traversing. Yeah. Something through there, just between trees or something, right? Yeah. Like you'd see that black, upright blob move. It does look like a place where you'd maybe find a cave. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's caves all over the place. There's probably caves on every single mountain here. It wouldn't surprise me. No. What would benefit them would be something that's reseeded behind one of those tree lines where the entrance was like that. We're almost at the same altitude as that helicopter. Yeah. Also, one of the things I realized is if something was standing still up there, I don't think I'd be able to differentiate it from a bush. No. Isn't that like another commonality that we, we see in like reports and stories, right? Is when they're seen, they just stop moving. Even if you know what they are, they, they will still bank on not moving versus running away. Yeah. Until they are absolutely certain they're busted. Yeah. Well, we've been going for an hour and 50 minutes. We've traveled 1.37 kilometers. What if something was smart enough and strong enough to have a cave entrance over there and then they block it off during the day with a big rock? Maybe. Can you imagine? Where it's like you wonder if any of these pockets of trees, if there's like an entrance somewhere. That's the cave that I would pick. Yeah. It's the one that's obstructed from the helicopters. Yeah. So we started at the lake. You would see where we were messaging our family members. We came up through the steep part on the north edge of the lake. This is where we were on our hands and knees crawling up. 
and then through here and up. And then we did our kind of almost like switchbacks through the boulder fields looking for Came up here where we turned around. We're looking at that stack of rocks and then came back down. And we ended up over here. So we should maybe go a little bit this way. A little bit, but like we're within like, we're talking like within like 30, 40 meters of yeah. where we would have crossed the same area. Probably less actually. We eventually made our way back down the precarious mountainside to our camp. The evening was extremely quiet and there wasn't any activity at all like the night before. We just enjoyed the wilderness around us and acted like we weren't really looking for the legendary beast. Maybe by utilizing this tactic, something would feel comfortable enough to come around. But nothing did. There was no activity throughout the entire night. The next day we decided to venture further down the main trail in hopes of making it to a more well-known lake. We didn't really know what to expect. Along the way we came across some beautiful mountain creeks which made it easy for us to fill up on water. We also came across these massive boulder fields that seemed to be the result of some sort of ancient landslide. The views were spectacular, but nothing was as spectacular as the moment the lake came into view. We enjoyed a quick lunch at the lake and after searching around for a little while and not finding anything unusual, we began to make our way back to our camp. Perhaps in the future this giant lake would be a location to base an expedition. By the way, I think one of the, the things that we kind of got lucky with 
is being born into a certain generation of people at a certain stage of the search for this creature, creatures. Um, so I think one of like the, the curses for like Thomas Steenberg is like, um, so he was young enough that all of this felt new and exciting when he was getting into it. Um, but there was probably a number of years, even decades, that probably passed by with his search where it felt like the, the discovery was right around the corner. The next report, the next, the next trackway, the next whatever, it always felt like they were getting better or they were getting closer or they were assembling enough information to paint a clearer picture of how to find one. And then it just never ca happened. And then those, those original guys, started passing away and it felt less in touch but like one of the things that Thomas has mentioned in a number of interviews is that it, it was a big enough of a deal and it felt real enough and the evidence seemed legitimate enough to give up everything and just go look for it in the, in this, the place where he thought he had the best shot of finding it get out of the army Go find a job in southern BC, southwestern BC. Look for this thing full time. Be closer to to Hinden. Be closer to Green. Be closer. I don't know where Burn lives. Probably the U.S. somewhere. And um, but yeah, to be closer to those people, collaborate, and figure this all out. And I don't know. Like there's, a, I think I talked to you about this one point too. There was like that uh, that South Korean guy that went to look for Sib to look for Siberian tigers. I think it took him his six years to get his first photograph of one, knowing where they are, knowing how to bait them, knowing how to find them, uh, knowing all of those things. He had to like go there, and I think by hand he had to like dig out subterranean bunkers. Like he built out like trenches. And then he would put like overhead protection. These are like almost like World War II machine gun trenches. And then, and then he would fully camouflage them, and they would just be just above the ground. So he'd be sitting in these things, not leaving them for weeks at a time, covering his scent, covering his odor, shitting in bags, like to get a photograph of a tiger that we already knew existed, and it was in that area. And and like that, and that was all of the work for this unknown creature. So what I think of these trips is that they're all lottery tickets. These are like the scratch off lottery ticket of looking for Bigfoot. Is it possible that you could be in the right place at the right time? Yeah, but even like when we're this far back, we're still pseudo limiting ourselves to like known areas. Like we didn't, like we're here in this area and like you just look around and look at all of the signs of human manipulation and the signs of continuous human occupation and usage of this area. And uh, maybe that's a good thing, right? Like we were saying before too, right? When humans come here, like us, we use um, these known spaces. We're very predictable. We're not out there at night doing things on mountains for sure. Not the sane ones of us at least. In the end, I think uh, people are correct that uh, um, the people that have the best shot of having some sort of meaningful interaction or documenting some sort of meaningful, tangible evidence is these long, if they're real, long-term experiencers. People that build up a slow rapport over the course of years through gifting, item exchanges, and knocking back and forth, other sort of non-verbal communication. Yeah, I think for us, it's gonna come down to one of two things. We're either gonna find a group that is a bit more aggressive and that somewhere that we stumble into, they will feel the need to push us out of in a very show you what's going on kind of way. Or we're going to have a property owner contact have to contact us with year round, with like year round or seasonal activity that we could count on, where we could leave equipment set and set up a little have a little setup. 
Though we didn't find any conclusive evidence on this trip or have any sort of face-to-face -face encounter with a Sasquatch, it's trips like these that keep me excited for expeditions in the future. With persistence and the drive to keep getting out to areas like this, something is bound to happen eventually. Something that will be the smoking gun in confirming the existence of Bigfoot. <laughs>